good afternoon and welcome to the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan's live stream broadcast of Canada, the US and Michigan mapping the business landscape. It's in partnership with the council corporate member Warner Norcross and Judd and is part of the World Trade Week 2021 events. I'm Michael Vendetta and I'm the executive director of the World Affairs Council and on behalf of my colleague, Eric Kubik and the board of directors of the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan, I welcome all of you. Thank you for adjusting with us as we program responsibly during this time of COVID-19. And we uh, hope that you will stay safe and show grace to those in your community. Council's mission is to empower the people and organizations of West Michigan to engage thoughtfully with the world. We do this with the help of over 50 regional companies 11 Michigan colleges and universities, and many community members. Together, we seek to provide programming that is credible, objective, relevant, civil, and compelling. To change the world, we believe, one must first know the world. And you can learn more about what we do at worldmichigan.org. This program is in place of our annual consular luncheon that we are pleased to do as part of World Trade Week in conjunction with the Grand Valley State University Van Andel Global Trade Center. And we're grateful for our collaboration with that fine organization. There's still time to register for tomorrow's World Trade Week sessions. And you can do that by going to gvsu.edu slash WTW. And you can get the links for doing so. We're also very grateful to Warner Norcross and Judd for its long-standing support of global awareness and education in our community. Representing Warner today is Tim Horner, partner at the firm, and he will welcome our special guests. Tim? Well, thank you, Michael. Um, you know, we at Warner have had the privilege in, uh, of uh, serving as counsel to Canada and to the Windsor Detroit Bridge Authority, which is Acadian Crown Corporation on the Gordie Howard National Bridge project uh, between Detroit and Windsor for about the last 20 years. And I have to say, you know, throughout that period of time, we've just had so many opportunities to interact with, uh, interface with, work with uh, the Canadian consulate in Detroit on so many issues and so many matters, not only pertaining to the Gordie Howard National Bridge project, but to other projects in Michigan as well. And uh, I'm so looking forward to this presentation, this discussion on these cross-border issues. They've been so helpful for us over all those years. And I do want to just take the opportunity to thank Cons uh, Consul General Joe Comartin and the entire staff at the consulate for all they've done for that project, which is just making tremendous progress right now, as well as on so many other projects. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this presentation. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to you. And what I think is being billed is the uh, Joe and Scotty show. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks again to Warner. Our format today is straightforward. We'll hear some opening comments from Council General Co. Martin, and then from Scotty Greenwood on the business landscape between Canada, the U.S., and Michigan. And then you'll have a chance to engage them in conversation about issues important to West Michigan. You may type questions into the YouTube comments section, or you may text them to 616-308-6560. Remember our house rules of the council to ask your questions succinctly and respectfully. Council General Joe Comartin was appointed as Canada's Council General to Detroit in the autumn of 2018 and is responsible for the states of Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. His uh, career spans the private and public sectors and most recently in academia. Mr. Cor Martin began his career as a civil litigation lawyer in Ontario, where he focused on criminal family and personal injury law. He was instrumental in founding the Canadian Auto Workers Legal Services Plan and served as managing director for the Windsor Essex region. He also helped establish cooperative housing and the CAW Child Care Center. He entered Canadian politics in 2000, serving as a member of parliament for 15 years. Highly regarded by his fellow MPs from all parties, he was thrice recognized as Canada's most knowledgeable parliamentarian. In Parliament, he rose to several leadership positions, including opposition house leader and deputy speaker of the House of Commons. 
Upon leaving elected office, he became a distinguished political scientist in residence at the University of Windsor, where he taught ethics and reform in Canadian parliament and constitutional law. Council General Comartin, we are so grateful to have you back. Welcome to West Michigan. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for those uh, generous uh, introduction points. And I'd also like to thank uh, Tim for his comments. He's, he's right about the long-term and very close relationship between his firm and, and the consulate here in Detroit. It's been a very uh, fruitful one for both sides and we appreciate the relationship. Um, as as uh, Michael said, I'm responsible for four states, um, although we're based in uh, right in Detroit, uh, right at the border uh, of the Detroit River. Um, it's uh, we have responsibility for all four states, and one that um, is a, a very important one because of the extent of the trade between our two countries. Um, but our relationship between Canada and the United States is much more than just a trading relationship. I lived in the Windsor Essex County area right across from Detroit and Ontario all my life. And uh, I know what it's like to uh, be part of this community uh, between Ontario and Michigan in particular. Uh, it's more like a family relationship than it is an economic or a business relationship. And, and we see that permeating the relationship in many, many ways. We share stewardship of our waters. Um, we have a reliable and accessible energy trade. We have very important and essential supply chains, particularly in the manufacturing and auto sector. And I think most importantly, we have the longest safe and secure land border of any place in the world. And that again is a testimony to the very close relationship and very important relationship between our two countries. It ends up when you look at that relationship on the, on the economic side to one of the most, if not the most successful economic partnership of any place on this planet. I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes now, Michael, and if I can pull up the first, first slide uh, to set the, uh, uh, the, the context of the relationship uh, in terms of the economic one. Uh, so as you can see on the slide, Canada is Michigan's number one customer asked the rhetorical question. Uh, I think a number of you may know some of this, but 394 Canadian owned businesses employ 30,344 people in Michigan. These are 2019 figures. Um, we sell, uh, uh, Canada, Michigan, I'm sorry, sells to Canada um, more than its next seven largest uh, foreign markets combined. And specifically, if you just look at China, the UK and Japan combined, Canada sells more to Michigan than those three countries, those huge economies. Next slide, please. And if you look specifically at some of the factors with regards to Michigan and Canada, uh, Michigan exports 17.3 billion in goods and 2.3 billion in services to Canada each year. The top Michigan exports, no surprise here, trucks, automobiles, and auto parts, that totaled $8 billion. And vice versa, Michigan services export for 2020, the, they, that amounted to, uh, in transportation services to 1.3 billion. Next slide, please. And again, Michigan imports 33.3 billion in goods from Canada on an annual basis. The top Michigan imports, again, no surprise here, from Canada into Michigan, automobiles and automobile parts, huge numbers a very clear reflection of just how important this trading relationship is. I'm gonna stop at this point and turn it, Michael, back to you so you can introduce my partner in crime here and uh, I'm looking forward to her, uh, her presentation as well. Thank you, Council General. Mary Scott, Scotty Greenwood is Crestview Strategy Partner and Managing Director of its US efforts. A former American diplomat to Canada and a frequent media commentator and public speaker, Scotty serves as a business and public policy advocate, communications expert, and political strategist to Fortune 500 companies, trade associations, and nonprofit organizations. Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian American Business Council, CABC. She has repeatedly been recognized by Canadian Newsweekly, The Hill Times, which 
Andrew, one of the country's top 100 people influencing Canadian foreign policy and the top 100 most influential people in government and politics. In 2001, Scotty spent four years as chief of staff of the U.S. Embassy in Canada, having been offered the diplomatic posting by President Clinton. During this time, she received the State Department's Meritorious Honor Award for innovative outreach programs to U.S. governors and Canada's premiers to foster cooperation on issues of mutual concern. From 1993 to 97, Scotty was the Director of Intergovern Intergovernmental Affairs for the City of Atlanta, handling state and federal relations. Before Scotty greets us, we're going to show a short clip from the CABC so you get a better idea of that organization's outreach. As the leading advocate for cross-border relations, the Canadian American Business Council is the champion of a unique global partnership. That partnership, built on a long tradition of common ground extending beyond our borders and into the deep roots of friendship. As neighbors, Canada and the US jointly steward our natural resources. We support each other when crisis strikes and when differences arise, the CABC is there, ensuring the shared interests of our partnership continue to stride forward. Comprised of entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and executives from some of the most recognized brands in the world, we set the table for conversation between business leaders and policymakers. And now we stand positioned to continue building on this exceptional relationship, ensuring that we face the world's greatest challenges together. Well, hey there, everybody. Thank you, uh, Michael, and uh, thanks thanks to the World Affairs Council uh, of Western Michigan. You know, I love World Affairs Councils. I I, I love to um, to interact whenever I'm invited. I was on the board of the DC World Affairs Council for many years, and uh, I just think it's such important work that you do and dialogue that you facilitate. So I'm a huge fan. And, and appreciate it very much. I want to say happy trade week. Uh, didn't realize it was trade week, so that's good to know. Um, what I know is it's the end of the quarter uh, for our kids at school. So like my, I'm, I'm still uh, on the academic calendar uh, in terms of what weeks we celebrate. So everybody's studying down around here. Um, I'm glad in that, in that particular intro video, we had Debbie Dingwall, like, you, you know, you always want to make sure uh, that, that in your canned stuff, there's somebody that everybody can relate to. And it's just lucky uh, in the little Brady Bunch photo at the end that we have a wonderful leader um, from your neck of the woods. Uh, anyway, really great to be with you and looking forward to the conversation. Um, ask us anything, throw anything at us. You know, uh, the Consul General will take the hard questions and, uh, and I'll take everything else. Um, you know, it, in the, the introduction, um, Gordy Howbridge, uh, you know, came up, and I just want to say I, th I think that is one of the iconic symbols. Um, the first, starting with the Ambassador Bridge, and now with the Gordy Howe Bridge, thinking about how interconnected um, our countries really are, and how vital and critical Michigan is in 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 all of this. I mean. The, amb the ambassador bridge, you know, carries more commerce um, in it, this one bridge, uh, than the entire U.S. relationship with Japan. There, Joe put some statistics up. There are lots of statistics to be had, but but really excited about, about um, the Gordie Howe Bridge now. And I will give you a little bit of inside news that hasn't been announced yet, but uh, the Canadian American Business Council is going to launch a podcast on Canada-US relations. Um, we're probably going to launch it right around Canada Day, 4th of July. And so we're recording episodes now. We're, we're partnering with the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars, which is another group here in Washington, DC. I'm, I'm in the nation's capital here. Um, actually, Arlington, Virginia, so just outside for those of you guys who travel here. Um, but anyway, uh, the Wilson Center and the Canadian American Business Council are, are launching um, a podcast series. We're calling it Canusa Street at C-A-N-U-S-A -S -S Street. Uh, and it's all about, we take one issue each session, uh, one Canada-US issue, and really dive into it. And uh, so Gordie Howe is one of the issues, we, is one of the sessions we just recorded. And, um, 
and and really looking forward to launching that. So we'll be sure to to let everybody know, and you can um, you can check that out. And, and just by way of also a little advertisement here at the top, I would love to stay in touch with people. It's a little funny in these in these scenarios. I can't see everybody on screen, but if you if you um, you know reach out on social media or on LinkedIn, just just you know put the little reminder of whack. Western Michigan, so I know I know where we met, and I'll and I'll accept the connection. I'm sure Joe's team will do the same. So so the Canada-U.S. relationship is is interesting. Um, it's 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 quite impactful, and it's something that for years and years and years, Canadians sort of said to Americans like, "You take us for granted, right?" And um, I used to say back, kind of flippantly, "Be careful what you wish for, because if the U.S. is focusing on you." it's probably not good. And then what we saw over, you know, recent years was there was some focus uh, from Washington uh, on Canada and it wasn't positive, right? There was a, there were, we, we sort of weathered, you know, big, a big tariff dispute with steel and aluminum tariffs and with counter retaliation. And, and so that, that wasn't so great, but I will say, um, we also managed with all of that kind of trade disputes and the heated rhetoric going, um, particularly coming out of, of Washington, um, often via Twitter, you know, notwithstanding all of that, we came out of that period with a fabulous new updated trade agreement um, that is really the gold standard for the world now. And so, uh, and and again, the, the the jobs and the livelihoods that are represented in the statistics that the Consul General mentioned, those are real. And I know people on this call know that and know how interconnected we are. Um, we are interconnected uh, on this piece of common ground that we share, our waterways, you know, and watersheds and and our people. So so we have we have a lot to be proud of in terms of um, of our commercial relationship, but also our interconnectedness and how we approach ch world challenges together. So, um, you know, with the new administration here in Washington, um, the first phone calls that the president and the vice president and many, many members of cabinet made were with their Canadian counterparts. And the first big bilateral meeting, even though it was by Zoom or, or by you know, whatever the platform was virtually, um, it was with Canada, uh, with the Biden administration. And what's interesting is when you have sort of the initial bilateral meetings, the bilats as people in DC and I will call them, it's usually just the leaders and then they might have a plus one or a plus, you know, you, you have the foreign minister, maybe the ambassador. So it's a, it's a, a bilat is really one-on-one -on -one, basically. In this case, and it's a testament to, I think a whole of government sort of approach uh, to the relationship and to some of the big challenges, it was like almost the full cabinet for both countries that sat down um, with each other. And so, you know, following that, so so the leaders announced a blueprint for Canada-U.S. relations. You can find it on on the internet. And then and then since then, <clears throat> and remember, you know, the Biden administration's only been around for a hundred and something handful of days, right? So it's still pretty new. Um, but, but since then, that bilat, there have been, you know, there's been outreach between counterparts. So the, the US Secretary of Energy and the Canadian Minister of Natural Resources, and you can go right through uh, the, the, um, the agencies. And it just tells you how much Canada and the United States have to work on together. Um, I, I only have one slide and I wonder if we could bring it up. Um, and just to give a sense of the President President Biden's infrastructure ambition. And yep, next slide there. There we go. And um, the fact that this administration really wants to not only invest in infrastructure, but also do it in a uh, climate friendly way, if you will. Now, this is just a, his first volley. Congress is going to have an awful lot to say about this. But if you if you want to look at sort of the proposals in Washington, um, you can go right through this slide and see um, what the U.S. is kind of thinking about and looking at. And um, I just put it up there uh, as a reference point because I think, as the Consul General may be able to elaborate, for each one of these U.S. initiatives, there is a Canadian sort of 
counterpart or element or element of collaboration. So you can you can take the slide down if you want now. Um, but th the point here is pick your poison, pick what you want to work on. There is a Canada US element and there's probably a Michigan Ontario element uh, to it and and the opportunities for us to thrive together are really large. What one, one last um, little uh, ad, little promotion I'll say uh, along these lines is if people are interested in how we in Canada and United States want to grow our economy together coming out of this terrible pandemic uh, that, we're, that we're still in, um, there's an effort that we've been involved in called North American Rebound. So it's the North American Rebound campaign. A lot of chambers of commerce, businesses and individuals on both sides of the border have signed up to say, you know what, no matter what happens, we're all in it together. And this is an effort that came up actually um, like a year ago when some, some governors in New England uh, in, in the United States were getting together saying, we've got to, we've got to source per personal protective equipment for our citizens and we don't want to compete against each other and drive up the price and all of that so let's form a let's form a block and we'll help each other and quebec uh in canada immediately said wait a minute we're we should be part of that block you know we're we're, we're actually linked together and so the quebec uh delegate general uh joe's counterpart in the united states and i were talking and we said you know what actually it shouldn't just be quebec and new england but it's actually all the states and provinces it's canada and the united states we should work together um, to figure out how we help each other and how we get through this. And that's really what our history is. And we're better when we work together than when we try to compete against each other. The US really needs Canada, really needs Canada and, uh, and vice versa. And, and so the more we lean into that, I think the better we do. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's something that I work on pretty much every single day. The, the other issue that I'll just close with um, in, in case people want to talk about it, and I know it's um, it's a sensitive issue, but it, you know th there is a there is a uh, pipeline, Line Five pipeline, um, that goes from Wisconsin through the Straits of Mackinac into uh, Ontario and Quebec, and it's something that uh, has been around for a long time. It's been the subject of a lot of debate. And Enbridge, its proponent, is a member of the board of directors of the Canadian American Business Council. So I'll just declare that right up front if people want to know where I'm coming from. But that it is an example. So there is some controversy, as I think people know, um, about that pipeline and its future. And it's the kind of thing where um, it's really important to look at actual facts, actual facts about our integration, how we help each other. Um, you know, you think about how much propane uh, Michiganders use Upper Peninsula and and uh, and in the Mitten, you know, and and a lot of that comes actually because of this pipeline. You think about the Detroit International Airport and the jet fuel. Um, a, a lot of that product comes from the pipeline. So while Canada and the United States are incredibly committed to a low carbon future and figuring out how we get there, we also have the reality of today. And we have to make sure that we have safe, efficient, responsible ways to transport all kinds of commodities, including oil and gas um, and everything else to market. So that's another big one I just thought I would put out there. We're um, hoping that, um, that that issue gets resolved. I think there's an arbitration underway. Uh, there's an international treaty that's at stake. Um, and uh, I think there's a good, healthy discussion happening about it. Um, but that, that's the other one I just wanted to raise, Michael. And with that, I will, I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you both, uh, Council General and Scotty, for getting us uh, started with some interesting ideas and statistics and, and issues. You can join the conversation by typing your question into the YouTube's comments section or by texting 616-308-6560. And uh, Scotty, you ended on this note of uh, line five. So uh, maybe we can talk about that uh, a minute. And uh, I think the Keystone pipeline might be, uh, there's a relation to that too. So while Canada and the US uh, tout their great friendship, there are um, issues related particularly to, to oil and to, to these pipelines that have been going back and forth for a long time. So. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that from, from Canada's point of view. Uh, 
um, how, how are these uh, how are these struggles over the pipelines uh, looked at? Yeah, well, I can start and, and Joe can can jump in if, if he wants to. Um, you know, they're different. First of all, these two particular projects, Keystone is something Keystone XL is something that was, you know, proposed and under constructed under construction um, versus Line Five, which has been safely operating for you know decades and actually has a has a plan to get even safer with the tunnel. Uh, proposal that the that the company and the previous governor worked out. So they're a li little bit different in that sense. Um, the, the other the other thing is is there is no surprise, um, I, I think, on the political position of either one. You know, the president, uh, President Biden during the campaign said that it would be his intention to revoke the Keystone permit. I, I think that was an unfortunate decision from the point of view of the planet, because we know that uh, as we transition to a low carbon future, we still need a safe uh, way to transmit the molecules um, and the products and pipelines are the safest way to do that. So a safe modern pipeline is the way to go while you're figuring out how to invest in renewables um, and in more efficient transition and in storage and all of that. Um, the, the Enbridge uh, project and, and decision is different. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's long standing, right? We're talking about something that has, that has been working <laughs> Um, safely for for many years and, um, and 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 so we'll see like this in the case of one of the similarities I guess would be that they're both international so it's not in my I'm not a lawyer so I'll give you my non legal opinion uh, I'm not sure uh, any governor as much as I admire and respect the governor of Michigan which I really do can can take an international uh, project, interstate international project, and just sort of declare a timeout. I'm not sure that will will work, but we'll see. The courts will decide, the arbitration will decide, um, and and we'll figure it out. I do know it's being discussed at at very serious levels. Joe would know more about that than I do, um, but it's it's we we are interconnected. We do need to help each other. These are projects that. Uh, don't just benefit Canada, although they do, but they, they, they create good union jobs in the United States. They benefit American households. Um, and they're, you know, it's, it's just a mutual interdependence that I think we need to acknowledge. Yeah, if I can, uh, Michael, um, I, think, I think you, again, I was like putting uh, issues like this in context. And as has as, uh, already been noted by Scotty, uh, you know, this pipeline went in there in 1953. Um, it's never had a leak. Um, but I have to say that the, the big concern that Canada has got, both because of the decision by the Biden administration to end Keystone, uh, not proceed with that, not allow that to proceed. And now this dispute over line five, we're concerned about a pattern developing here where energy that flows from Canada to the United States is gonna to continue to be interfered with. 80% um, of uh, the fuel that comes out of Canada goes to the United States. We're the single biggest supplier of, uh, outside of the United States to uh, oil and gas into the United States. We supply a great deal of energy, electricity as well because of our hydroelectricity and nuclear power plants. Uh, and we're, we're quite concerned about, are we seeing a pattern developing here? So that's that's at top of mind from the perspective of the Canadian government. Um, I, I just want to emphasize a couple of the points that Scotty made, though, um, and maybe expand on them. In terms of its impact, if that got shut down, which is going to be for a relatively short period of time, because we expect the tunnel uh, will go, will get built and be finished by around 2024, which the governor supports on an ongoing basis. Um, but in that interim period of time, the impact on the economy. Um, in the uh, in the state of Michigan, in the state of Ohio, in the province of Ontario, and the province of Quebec is going to be quite phenomenal. We're talking about thousands and thousands of jobs lost, at least for a short period of time of anywhere from months to a couple of years. Um, we're going to probably see an increase in carbon emissions uh, because the alternative of moving this fuel is going to have to be by truck, train, or ship, barges probably. That's an interesting thing about the barges, you know, one of the reasons this line got built originally back in 53 was because of the concern of barges moving fuel in the Great Lakes and the high risk of, a, of an accident. And it was one of the precipitating factors of why this, this pipeline should be put there. 
the fact that we've now moved ahead, you know, from an environmental standpoint, we're at a more advanced stage, that we replace that with a tunnel, which will be as close to 100% safe as anything can be, um, I think reflects um, the evolving process. Give Enbridge credit that they were agreed to do this. They've agreed to pay the whole shot on it, um, and it certainly will resolve it. Uh, but the end result, if, if this thing gets shut down, major economic impacts to all those jurisdictions I mentioned, and probably some significant impact on the air quality in this region. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Scotty referred to uh, USMCA as the gold standard. Did I hear her say that in, in, in trade agreements? <clears throat> yep. Came about the last couple of years. And uh, <clears throat> there's a question about uh, uh, that particular agreement and how that's impacting uh, trade right now, the, the new USMCA. And, and where does Mexico fit in? It's the third mm -hmm. country in this equation. Um, how are they fitting into this? And is, is COVID have any impact on the rollout of USMCA? Yeah. So, so Mexico is awfully important in this. It's a trilateral agreement. It's a North American agreement. Um, it's not clear that the president of Mexico, AMLO, as people call him by his initials, um, is as supportive of free trade and economic integration as his predecessor was, right? So AMLO, president, the current president of Mexico inherited this agreement. Now he agreed to it, he signed it, but he didn't negotiate it. And it's not, it's not really his politics. So there are some challenges in Mexico. There's no doubt about it. Um, there are challenges. COVID also uh, provided, provided a number of challenges. One of, the, one of the challenges that related to Mexico and COVID was factories were shut down kind of right at the beginning with no, um, no sort of discussion on what happens with the supply chain. So Canada and the United States were very careful at the beginning of this pandemic when we closed our border to non-essential travel to make sure that essential commerce continued. And I think, I think the two governments get a lot of credit for, for making a quick decision um, that went very well. Now, I have, I have a view about uh, how it's going now and how quickly I think the border should be, uh, you know, commerce should be resumed. But, but I think we have to give credit where credit's due. In Mexico, it was less seamless. Um, and, and there were some decisions made um, in individual cases that had big impacts on the, on the essential supply chain. And that wasn't done particularly well. So I, I, think, um, I think we've learned a lot uh, through this pandemic, but I do think there are some challenges um, with full implementation of the new USMCA, particularly with respect to Mexico. They're, they don't uh, love the new labor uh, standards that uh, were insisted upon by the United States and Canada um, and will continue to be monitored carefully by policy uh, uh, makers. And so there's, uh, I, think there, I think there's some, uh, some real tension there. Yeah. Michael, if I can pick up on that, the. Um... Just in terms of what happened at the uh, at the point when we, we began to close our borders or tighten them up, um, I, I think with, without the kind of agreement we had both under NAFTA and under the USMCA, uh, and probably a bit better under the USMCA, we were able to keep those those uh, supply chains alive and healthy. Um, the first couple of months certainly there was a slowdown because we simply weren't in the manufacturing sector. We weren't moving. Uh, nearly as many products because they weren't being uh, weren't being built. Um, but for instance, in the agricultural sector, those continue to flow on on personal protection equipment. Um, you know, a, a very very high numbers of actually an increase in the exchange between our two countries, and that certainly would would have been facilitated by the existence of the USMCA. But you know, once we got through that first couple of months, and, and the company started reopening in May. Uh, the traffic across the, uh, the Ambassador Bridge uh, was down by between five and seven percent on average, uh, all the way through right up to the present time. Um, and again, I think that's a reflection of the cooperation between the two countries, uh, really reflecting the spirit of the USMCA or CUSMA, as we call it in Canada. Um, that that cooperation, in terms of deciding what was essential, uh, was done quite quickly, quite efficiently, and very effectively, so that the supply chains were, were not interrupted. Now, I know that um, Scotty has some concerns about the existing situation. Uh, we've tinkered with that on the Canadian side. We're certainly 
uh, some of the restrictions we have in place are certainly more uh, rigid than they are on, on the US side. Um, we've tinkered with it, made it, uh, for instance, easier for uh, family reunification, especially in the cases of illness and, and family deaths. Um, but there's still, there's still uh, improvement. I think the, the spike that we saw in, the, uh, in the, uh, case, the COVID cases in both in Michigan and in Ontario over this last month has prevented some further uh, lessening of restrictions, but they're coming. Um, once the vaccinations roll out and we move towards you know, full, full vaccinations, uh, um, I think you'll see uh, restrictions uh, gradually being lifted probably in, in piecemeal but I'm hoping or expecting by the end of the year that the border will be completely reopened. One of the things I'll just say, Michael, if I could on this is, uh, I think it's important to resist the urge to um, put all of COVID, all of the COVID worry on travel, right? Because there are, uh, there, are, there are things like community spread, there are things like testing, there are things like vaccine distribution, that have a huge impact um, uh, on, 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 on COVID. And so it's not all about travel. Um, it's, it's all about a lot of things. And, and I think we have to be really careful. Uh, my admonition, not to Joe um, as a public servant, but to politicians is man, oh man, like don't politicize this, you know, with that, that doesn't work. What works is really looking at evidence and really listening to um, non-political forces who, who can talk about things like community spread in, in plants um, versus it's not just about travel. Um, it's not just about truck drivers or people who wanna fly. And I, I think that's important to understand. Uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, Quite an astute question from a listener here as we go back uh, one more time to the Great Lakes. Given the fact that Lake Michigan, Lakes Michigan and Huron are hydraulically connected and therefore a single lake, I've heard that distinction before. Does the current dispute between Canada and the US over line five uh, suggest the need for a new treaty focused on the regulation of the use of Lake Michigan and Huron. Uh, this would be in addition to the Pipeline and Boundary Waters Treaty. If, if, if so, what do you see as principal components of that treaty? I, I had not heard of that distinction of one lake, and I wonder if you, you uh, can comment on that. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those examples, Michael, where I think it would be great if, if we had a different format and the person asking the question could come up and kind of... Uh, give us a briefing because I think it's a good question about whether or not the um, Boundary Waters Treaty, I think of 1909 or the Transit Treaty of 1977, like are the treaties that we have in place enough, sufficient in the watershed and in, in our economic connection or do we need something new? I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a really important question. Uh, and I think we'll see some courts uh, opining because uh, they have to deal with what exists, not what they wish would exist. But I, I think it's a worthy question and I, I don't know the answer. I think Michael, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of all the experiences I'm having uh, you know, in terms of contacts with the, the International Joint Commission, um, all of the commissions in the Great Lakes, there's I think at least a half dozen that uh, our consulate uh, is regularly involved with. And the suggestion of a new treaty has, has not been, I haven't heard that from any of them. Um, and I think in part that may be because those commissions and the IJC are constantly looking at ways that the two countries can cooperate on whether it's, uh, you know, alien species, um, any number of other issues, uh, the phosphorus getting into the Great Lakes, that we seem to be able to work on that and work towards solutions uh, within the framework of the existing treaties and agreements that we have. Um, uh, so I, I have to say, I, I've not heard of anybody suggesting that we need, need more in that route because of the work that's going on both at the IJC and also at all these Great Lakes commissions. Thank you. A uh, question from a listener, apart from energy issues, what are key business issues for the next five years between Canada and Michigan? in particular, probably I would imagine the automotive industry, it's 
related to because there's a secondary question how will the move of two electric vehicles impact the massive trade between Michigan and Ontario related to auto products? So um, are, are there some other key business uh, issues that are on top of mind for each of you as you think about the relationship in the next few years? Well, I'd have to say, Michael, that obviously the auto industry is the one at the top of mind because of the, the electrification and the, the move towards autonomous vehicles which uh, you know, my perspective is the autonomous vehicle, all that artificial intelligence um, has sort of been moved off to the side a bit, both because of the pandemic and having to, you know, the automobile companies having to deal with uh, the consequences of that pandemic. Um, the, so the, but the, the electrification, that chart that, uh, that uh, Scotty had posted, uh, you know, the second or third item on there was the electrification of the, of the auto of transportation. Um, and by the way, it's not just it's not just auto. It's trains and and boats and uh, and airplanes as well that we're looking at. But for this region, yeah, that's got to be the top of, of mind for uh, for the work. And there is collective work going on. So, for instance, um, we just Canada just uh, provided support for, for uh, announcements by GM, Ford, and Solantis on uh, developing. And, and building uh, electric vehicles in southwestern Ontario. Um, you see the same thing happening on the U.S. side. But as those things are happening, those companies are working internally, uh, collectively, whether that development is on the Canadian side or the U.S. side. And it's very extensive. The big item on it, um, I have to say, though, is, is the whole issue of the batteries. Um, that, that There's a real scarcity uh, of capacity right now. Uh, that's going to be an expansive area. It's going to have certainly a, a big impact on employment uh, because they're, we're going to be needing to open a number of plants uh, in this region, uh, Midwest, all the way through southwestern Ontario, probably into Quebec on the Canadian side. So that that is very much uh, uh, going on now. Planning is going on. Uh, the developments are going on. If GM is serious about meeting the 2035, uh, uh, all their vehicles being electric, um, there's a lot, a lot of work that's going to be doing and a lot of development work uh, that's going to have to happen. I agree with that, Michael. In addition to autos uh, and uh, energy, I think you got to look at professional services. You got to look at digital trade um, and, th and then you've got to look at agriculture, you know, uh, uh, how, how we uh, help uh, feed each other and feed the world. Um, that a lot of that business happens in, in this part of the world as well. You know, Scotty, one of the things that uh, we missed in the USMCA it was on the table at one time was the ability of certain uh, uh, trades to be able to move professionals, but trades as well to be able to move back and forth. Um, and uh, that list, we've got a list, I don't know, 40 or 50 types of, of occupations, a number of them out of date now, and a number not on that list that really badly needs to. And that's one of the areas that the, uh, the USMCA or in some other way, uh, we've got to deal with that issue because the need for, for people to be moving back and forth in the kind of relationship we have you know, between the three, three countries is an absolute imperative. And these are crucial workers in many, the new ones in particular, the new professions are crucial to the development of the, uh, this area of the, of the economy. You're right, Joe. So labor mobility is a, is a big issue as between Canada and the United States. It always gets, politically, it always gets um, hung up on how the U.S. feels about mobility with Mexico. So that's just a political reality. Um, the, the northern border situation, the southern border situation from, from Canada and the United States uh, couldn't be more different. Um, but it's, 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 it's labor mobility, but it's also accreditation, right? If you're, if you're a nurse, um, in one country or the other, you can't, or a doctor, or lots of other professions, you can't practice in the other country without redoing your accreditation. And when we're having global health, you know, crisis, uh, a, a nurse trained in, in Canada is, would be perfect for the US and vice versa. So we got, we got to deal with some of those issues. Those are pretty big. I agree, Joe. Yeah, well, given the 1,500, 1,800 nurses that cross the border between Windsor and Detroit every day, uh, we can attest yeah. to the fact of you know how important it is to have, and and you can you can multiply that with a number of other professions. That's right. That, that aren't allowed to move across. That's right. Well, and just a quick anecdote here, Michael. There was a Hurricane Sandy, I think it was years ago, um, in the eastern part of the United States, wiped out uh, 
a big, big swath of like New Jersey and Long Island and all of that. And there were, there were pi pipelines that were at risk. And so we needed, so, so that you wouldn't have a, a further catastrophe beyond all the flooding and destruction of the hurricane, you needed to shore up those pipelines. And there were pipe fitters and pipeline workers just across the border in Canada that were ready to come help. And they were closer than any of the other rescue crews that would have come from Louisiana or other parts of Southern United States. You know, they were two or a few hours away as opposed to days away and getting them across the border, getting them allowed to travel because of these restrictions that Joe and I were talking about was like, I ended up having to talk to the secretary of transportation directly. You know what I mean? Like it went all the way up and it's like, okay, wait a second. We have a catastrophe. You don't want an explosion or God forbid something else to happen because you wouldn't allow a crew uh, a Canadian crew to come across the border. And so we get the US to agree to it. And then on the Canadian side, they were like, wait a minute, you can't do it because the Charter of Rights and Freedom says that you can't be subjected to their rules and whatever. And I thought, holy moly, we got the US to agree. And then Canada said, no, Canada fixed it also. And they were able to come. Uh, but but that was a, a close call. And so we've got to we've got to be able to help each other out in times of in times of crisis too. Yeah, because otherwise you get those dumb arguments. I mean, that argument around the Charter was and I say that because I taught the, I taught at the law school and charter. That was just a really dumb argument, but you know it got it got raised by a group on the Canadian side. Yeah. Anyway, it got resolved fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, this uh, this quote came my way. Apparently, maybe you know better. Uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau once said, "Living next to the U.S. is in some ways like sleeping with an elephant. No matter how friendly or even tempered is the beast." if I can call it that, one is affected by every twitch and grunt. And we had the last administration with America first, and now the new administration is by American. Mm -hmm. how, how does Canada in the, in the, in the business enterprises in, in, in the country deal with some of this conversation and rhetoric and, and, uh, and trying, to get, trying to get business done uh, under these kinds of conversations going at the political level? You know, Michael, there is a, a, a Mexican diplomat that uh, that talked about that quote from Pierre Elliott Trudeau about the mouse in bed with the elephant. And the Mexican said, you know what? To, said to Canada, you know what? At least you're on top. <laughs> so um, I, I think there's a different analogy with uh, for Canada and the United States. I think the elephant and mouse is, is, is outdated with all due respect to the former prime minister. Um, I think we suffer from what I'll call the binocular syndrome. So we're, we're looking at each other through the same set of binoculars. So I'm Canada, I'm looking at you in the US and everything looks bigger and closer than it really is. You can, you know, the US is looking backwards through the same set of binoculars. And you know what, when you look backwards through binoculars, everything is further and tinier than it really is. So the binoculars really, um, I say this with all due respect to my friends in media, are the media. Canadian media magnifies everything in the United States bigger than it really is. The same story in, in a Canada US story in Canada could be front page news above the fold for, for weeks. And it's barely mentioned once in kind of the business section on page B4 in the US. So there's a magnet, there's a there is a magnification um, effect. Another way people talk about it is the Canada US border is a one way mirror. And the US looks in the mirror and we see ourselves. Canada looks through the mirror and sees the US. Um, so uh, in terms of Buy America, look at it, it's, it, this, is, this is something, um, Buy Local is something that has existed for, for decades and it's, it's really not new. And the instinct to, if you're gonna spend government US taxpayer dollars to spend it on American companies makes a lot of sense. The question will be can the extent to which Canada is able to secure an exemption or a carve in so it's really by U.S. Canada, given the reality of our integration, um, more than it's by American. By American typically is not, um, typically isn't focused on Canada. It's focused on like, let's make sure we don't flood our markets with uh, products coming in from like China or other adversaries. So I think, I think there's a way through it. Canadian American Business Council, my organization, we're working hard on this. I know the government of Canada is working hard on this and U.S. suppliers need to be able to, to supply from trusted partners when they can't get it locally. And that happens a lot with Canada. Um, so I, I think there'll be a path through. It'll be a little bumpier than we hope, but I, I think we'll get there. 
I agree with that analysis, Scotty. I, I think the uh, uh, what we're looking at, uh, Michael, just so the uh, listeners can uh, understand this, the historically, you know, we've had these types of provisions at the federal level in the United States and Canada, uh, and now Mexico to a great extent have been granted exemptions. Um, the target is. As Scotty says, is is you know China and Asia and in some cases Europe, um, and so uh, those of us who are part of the USMCA, part of this continent, have been granted exemptions. And overall, we we Canada has been satisfied with that. Our greater concern right now is some of the initiatives we're seeing along the same lines of restrictions or by America type of policies at the state level, and and there's not a similar history of those types of exemptions being granted to Canada or Mexico. So that's that's area that, that we're we're watching because we think ultimately we'll be in, and I say that from talking to a number of the members of Congress and some of the Senate uh, from both parties, um, they seem to be quite comfortable that the past relationship is the one that will continue on. That's at the federal level. Again, we've got more concerns at the state level. Well, and if I, I just hasten to add here with with a great deal of love and respect for my Canadian distinguished diplomat. Uh, it's not just U.S. states that practice by local and by America. There are there are little protectionist measures that erupt in in, in other countries, including in Canada, and uh, and and sometimes you can't even trade within Canada between provinces. So just you know, there's a lot of work for all of us to do to become better practitioners of free trade. If I may say it. That way. I mean, Scotty, that point about you know, yeah, we have less problems act. Actually, with uh, trading with the United States than we do in some cases uh, within our own provinces, you know, from province to province. You know, we keep working at it, but we never get to a, a realistic solution. It's still a problem. That means I can't get wine from British Columbia on any kind of an efficient basis right now. Yeah, you'll just have to drink California wine. Yeah. Well, I'm into the, you know, we got lots of wine right here in Essex County, and, and we've got that up in the Niagara Peninsula. Very good wines, actually. And in Michigan, and in Michigan too, and and, and given given uh, given uh, Michigan's importance to Canada, we talked about this. Both of you did talk about the import and export just to this state alone. Uh, are you getting wind of any of that kind of thing happening uh, in the state of Michigan, Joe? With a you know more protectionist point of view, you think you think the Michigan uh, politicians are more aware of how critical the relationship is than maybe other states and. I think that's definitely true. I mean, the, the knowledge level is, is much higher amongst the, the Michigan the House, both at the state and the federal levels. Um, and as far as the four territories, I'm responsible for the only uh, state that we're, we're uh, monitoring right now is Kentucky. They have a piece of legislation, actually two different pieces of legislation that have been floating around. It hasn't moved, uh, was attempted once before, I think a few years ago and didn't go anywhere, but that's the only state of the four that I'm responsible for that are looking at actual legislation. Well, there goes your bourbon. Yeah. Well, I've threatened. I've threatened to, uh, you know, get back into a tariff war with them if they don't stop. We've got some meetings coming up on this, so I think we'll get it resolved. Interesting question here, uh, Scotty. Uh, listener enjoyed hearing uh, the common sense thought process of continuing using fossil fuels in the most efficient and clean way as we develop cleaner options. Um, with which organizations is the CABC working to push this thought process and change the minds of people making these decisions? Thanks for the question and the comment. I think if you look at NorthAmericanRebound.com, you will see um, the organizations in the, that, are, that are kind of aligned with us in this idea that we're in it together. In terms of the um, carbon transition and and the infrastructure uh, challenges, it's 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 a motley crew uh, of of different groups getting together. Um, I think the uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Michigan. There are there are several kind of business focused groups that are really interested in in making sure there's a um, a rational. Uh, way to to get through this, we you know we care a lot about. I think it's important to understand that the business community um, cares a lot about innovation in sustainability. You know there is an awful lot of investment in in carbon capture and utilization, for example, that is made possible by um, 
by traditionally, you know, by old by old sector industries that are transitioning to be part of the solution on the environment. And so, um, th there's a lot of work. Carbon X Prize is a really interesting example of um, if you if you check them out of facilitating um, innovation in how to solve these big planetary problems and. You know, business has an absolute role to play uh, along with civil society, along with activists um, in trying to figure out what the answer is. And, and we try to we try to engage, you know, in all fronts. Yeah, thanks for that. One more question before we, we wrap up, and it's about uh, China and uh, U.S. and Canada being mixed up in these all of these uh, trilateral situations. We got two Canadian citizens who are being held. In China, we've got a Chinese citizen being held in Ch in Canada. We've got all this rhetoric going back and forth. How do the how the, how are the countries seeing their way through some of this in in terms of both dealing with and working work both working with and dealing with China? You want to go first, Scotty, or? Scotty, you're on mute. On mute. <laughs> um, the, the China uh, dealing with China is 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 awfully challenging for everyone in the world, um, including its direct neighbors, uh, including including everyone in the world. Um, and we don't share the fundamental values um, that Canada and the United States and and a lot of democracies share. Are just simply not shared by China, and you know, probably two years ago, I was on a panel in um, Halifax with the former Canadian um, Trade Minister, a guy named Pierre Pettigrew, uh, who Joe knows well, and he, you know, he was Trade Minister uh, in government at the time when I was in government in the Clinton administration, and the idea at the time was let's bring China into the World Trade Organization um, because maybe they can, you know. Get a taste of what free trade, you know, what 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 global trade with democracies really um, really is like, and the prosperity that comes with it, and and maybe they will um, sort of see the light from our point of view, right? And and Pierre Pettigrew, I was surprised at the time, and this is not a radical statement now, but it was the first time I heard anybody say it. he was one of the negotiators at the time. And I was involved in a government that was for it, Canada was for it. And he says, you know what, in, in hindsight, it was a big mistake. China didn't change uh, its, its ways or its behavior or its outlook, uh, its, its fundamental values. So, um, so, so dealing with China, both the opportunity that it represents um, economically, but also the threats uh, that we face um, is, 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 a, is one of the challenges of our day. Um, honestly, and uh, it is outrageous that the two Michaels are, are imprisoned uh, still after all of this time in China. I hope there will be some sort of resolution. I will say that uh, a, a good friend of mine, the former U.S. Ambassador to Canada, Kelly Craft, the Honorable Kelly Craft, who just yesterday we announced joined the Canadian American Business Council's advisory board, along with former United States Senator Heidi Heitkamp. So we have two great leaders joining us, but Kelly Kraft was in the Trump administration at the time. And she was, I think, the first U.S. leader who really called China to task on the imprisonment of the Michael. She was very forward on that. And we now see um, groups like the Halifax International Security Forum being very forward in awarding Taiwan with their John McCain award. Um, so, so there is a lot of discussion uh, I don't know how this nets out. I will leave it to the diplomats who are involved in it. It's very sensitive. It's very important. And it, I mean, it's a really good question. And, and it, there, there aren't easy, direct, obvious answers. Well, one thought that has occurred is like, what do you do about China? A friend of mine, former Canadian diplomat named Colin Robertson, you know, he and I were, he knows a lot about China. He served there. He's written about it a lot. He's a big thinker in Canadian foreign policy. And I say, Colin, what can Canada and the U.S. do? You know, like we, we don't want to, you know, what, what, what are some things we can do to really get China to think differently? And you know what he said? He said, you know, well, one thing we could start with is there are a lot of high ranking Chinese Communist Party leaders whose kids go to college in the U.S. and Canada. And we could deny those kids visas for, to do that. And you know what would happen then? 
the mothers would get involved, right? <laughs> and the mothers would say to the their husbands, "What? I don't know what you're doing in policy. Well, they're very sophisticated, but you know, but our kid can't go to school at the University of Michigan or, uh, you know, at Georgetown or at McGill or at St. Evacs, and you better fix that. So whatever's bugging them that's screwing that up, I think there might be a way uh, to get some attention that way. And it sounds kind of goofy, but that's the kind of thing, you know, that, that might actually, you know, might, might actually help. Um, Michael, I, that's the first suggestion I've heard. I, Cause I, I, I was going to say to you, I don't see a path through and I'm, I'm speaking, I think for our, our government at this point, we don't see a, a an opening here. Uh, there is such a difference in values between, you know, our jurisdictions and, and China that, you know, the rule of law just doesn't mean much to them as it does to, to us. Um, but I, I want to take this opportunity to, to say to the United States, Canada really appreciates, and this is true both of the, the Trump administration and the current uh, Biden administration, you know, that they've stepped up and have expressed very clearly to China that they're wrong in retaining the, and uh, keeping in custody the two, uh, the two Michaels and having a farce of, of trials, all of that. They've been very strong in speaking that, and we really do appreciate them doing that. Thank you both so much. We've got more questions, but our time is, is up. So uh, how, can, uh, how can folks in West Michigan keep in touch with, with you and, and your offices and, and what you're doing? How, what's the best way for them to keep tabs on, on uh, actions of your office and your actions? Yeah, well, I've got a, I've got a Friday newsletter. So if you go to uh, the Canadian American Business Council, uh, you, can, you can sign up for that if you, if you want to hear from me every Friday. Um, you could also connect on different social media platforms, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook with the Canadian American Business Council or with me. Um, happy to connect that way. Uh, I'm not on TikTok. Uh, thank, thankfully for that. Uh, speaking, of, speaking of Chinese AI, uh, but they managed to get all of our kids addicted to it. But um, I, I would love to stay connected. And I'm so grateful, Michael, to you, to the Consul General, to all the team uh, that put all this together. Uh, this has been a really a really fun discussion for me and, I, and I'd, I'd love to keep it going uh, with folks. So thank you for that. You can also connect with me on Clubhouse if anybody's on that particular app. Um, Michael, uh, the, the, our contact would have to be through the consulate. Uh, we don't have anywhere near sophisticated uh, uh, service as uh, Scotty does, um, probably because we're not nearly as literate as she is. Um, but um, yeah, they can always contact us through the through the Canadian consulate, and, and we have a number of services, obviously, that we, that we provide, and uh, both in the you know in policy issues and and in the trade areas. So we're happy to help. Marvelous. Marvelous. Uh, I'm sorry. I should also thank you. Uh, this is really good. I look forward to doing this. Um, I mean, I got to put up with Scotty, but that aside, it's it's enjoyable um, uh, doing these and. Uh, and we'll keep doing it as long as uh, we're here. I'm only here for about another 15 months, so you can schedule a couple of more over the next couple of, uh, you know, next 15 months, and we'll we'll come back and do this again. You might have to provide food next time, and it might have to be in person. Good. Here, 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 here. Oh, you know, you're always you're always welcome in West Michigan and in Grand Rapids. We'd love to be able to have you in person, and uh, you know the. The Joe and Scotty show has legendary status now in our part of the state. So uh, that's a sad statement. <laughs> I'll have to uh, make sure that that happens. Thank you both very much. Thank you, listeners, for being with us. We'll continue to program during this uh, during this time of virtual programming, and uh, you can register. Remember, you can register for World Trade Week sessions tomorrow, all day at gvsu.edu/wtw. And um, we're going to be back uh, next Tuesday at 6 p.m. for our annual program year closing World Quest Global Trivia Game, which we do every year with corporate and educational members. You can register at worldmichigan.org slash worldquest2021.